This is Reverend J.W. Smith, pastor of the New Salem Missionary Baptist Church, 2186 Hawkins Mill Road, Memphis, Tennessee, 38127. Again, we want to just say again, thank you for joining us um, for this Bible study lesson on this Thursday. Uh, we thank God for this day and this opportunity. New Salem is a growing church for growing people going all out for God. Uh, I want to thank you all uh, who are joining me and we invite you to come in and worship with us uh, this Sunday as we go back into the building at 11 o'clock. We will have abbreviated services due to, because the pandemic is still alive and well. Uh, we will be following all CDC guidelines as that you will must have a mask on. If you do not have a mask, we will provide one for you. We will be taking temperatures and we will be as socially distant as, hum as humanly possible. Uh, if necessary, we will move from one service per Sunday to two uh, to make sure that we're providing adequate space and place for all those who desire to come and still be socially distant. Uh, we must submit to a, a temperature check coming in also. Um, but again, we are going back into the building this Sunday. We encourage you to come work with us from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock. The services will again be abbreviated, uh, but we will uh, give God the best of our services. Again, uh, we will continue to stream our Sunday services on YouTube and on Facebook, uh, and we will continue for the time being to continue to do this Bible study each Thursday at 12 o'clock noon. Uh, also on uh, this Thursday, page on the New Salem Missionary Baptist Church Facebook page uh, and also on YouTube. For those who do not know uh, or who may be unaware, uh, the notes for this and all other lessons are on my Facebook page and the YouTube Facebook page with the accompanying scriptures and, and they're there for your ability to be able to take notes follow me with those notes take your own notes uh and then go back in detail and study these uh in depth uh i do apologize for this this, this second rebroadcast uh i was we were on just a few minutes ago for a few minutes but uh i did a software instead of a hardwire and i had to go back and hardwire my computer not to lose connection i think brother charles ambrose and i might have been the only two on uh but for those who are on and those who may be coming on again we invite you to come fellowship with us and if you can't fellowship with new salem we encourage you uh, to get somewhere in the study of the word of god because god is his word christ is his word there is a living word a written word and a spoken word and we find that jesus christ was the, the, the living word of our of our god uh, in order to know him and his plan for your life uh, and how to follow him and worship him then you must get Get in, you must be in his word. Amen. He says, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, then you can ask what you will and it shall be done. That's John 15, 7. Uh, we uh, thank God again for you and this opportunity. Again, uh, we will be open this Sunday. We invite you, if you can, to come out and fellowship with us uh, in that service uh, and partake of communion with us and the study of our God, who is truly great and greatly to be praised. Uh, we thank God for you uh, as we move into this lesson. This is a beautiful day, beautiful weather, uh, and we thank God for it because this is the day that he has made for us. Uh, today, again, final reminder that the notes for this are on my Facebook page and the New Salem Facebook page. Uh, and we're dealing today with love that intercedes. But in this, this quarter, we're dealing with love for one another and specifically in this unit too which starts this month we're dealing with an inclusive love and again i want to make help you understand what inclusive love is inclusive love is love that involves or includes those that you would not normally uh involve or include amen the bible says that, that to love those who love you and to love your family those that are close to you in your inner circle uh, you have not done any great thing because even unsaved people do that. Uh, even animals do that. Uh, but an inclusive love means uh, do you have the ability to love those who persecute you and pray to those who spite, despitefully use you? And again, um, in order to actuate, amen, we demonstrate and actuate our love for God by loving one another. Many people think that they can love God and hate everybody else. That is not the case. Uh, 1 John 3, uh, 15, 3, 14 says, and we know that we pass from death unto life because we love the brother. Amen. So again, we actuate 
and demonstrate our love for God by loving one another. Amen. You cannot love God without loving me. Amen. Don't, don't fool yourself. Let me say that again. You cannot love God without loving your brother. If you've been taught, you've got Jesus and, and, and that's all you need. You've been mistaught. And if there's all you got is Jesus, then you probably don't have him. Amen. Because in order to have him, you must have those that he saved also. God bless your heart. He's got one hand and he holds us in all of his hand. And if you can't get along with me, the only way to get rid of me is to get out of his hand. Amen. God bless you. And so we must love one another. Amen. And, and we deal with an inclusive love. Now, today we drill even further down. Uh, we deal with love that intercedes. Amen. Love that intercedes. Remember, love at its best is an action word. The gape means a decision. It means I'm, I'm, I'm acting on a decision to do right by you, no matter how my emotions feel about you. Amen. So watch this. Agape has nothing to do with my emotions. Amen. Uh, and, and it may have to do with my affection for you. But agape deals more with my affection for God as I choose to honor his word. Amen. By doing right by mankind. Did you get that? And that is agape love. Uh, I can be sick. I can feel ill toward you. Amen. And still agape you because it is a constant, it is a conscious decision to do right by you according to the word of God. And so we're drilling down. We're talking about love that intercedes. Remember, love is not to be on the, on the coffee table. It's not a coffee table Bible, but love is a working Bible in your, a Bible that, that, that is at work in your heart. And so we're talking about the verb form of love. And so we're talking about love that intercedes. It does what? Love that, that acts on behalf of another. Did you get that? Intercessory love, love that intercedes, is love that not works on itself but love that works for the good or the favor, amen, of other people. Your light of love should not be shining on yourself. If you're in the spotlight of your own love, then that's not love. But your love is designed to be shed or shine on those who are around you. Amen. That, that's how the love of God is shed abroad in our heart. Amen. Because we love not, we love esteem others more than ourselves. Amen, somebody. And so we're talking about love and intercede, love that stands in the gap. And uh, I, I, I'll say this as I move into this text. Uh, what, what the churches today lack is love that intercedes. Uh, because we find in church today, there are too many people coming in to look at the faults of other folk. We do things to make people love us, and then we find reasons not to love them back. Somebody say, ouch. This is what I said. I said, we do things to make people love us. But then we'll find reasons not to love them back. We want people to praise us. Amen. But when we get behind their back, we scorn them and pull them down. That's not love that intercedes. Love that intercedes is if I find my brother in a fault, I go to my brother in a loving way to build him up, to strengthen him, to grow him, to build him up in the stature uh, of, 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 of Jesus Christ. It's not designed to tear down. There's too much tearing down in the church. Amen. Amen. They look, we look down our noses and we turn down people's names, relationships, and, 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 and stature. No, we are to build one another up in Christ. Amen. That's why we assemble ourselves to exhort one another unto every good work. It's easy to find the worst in me. Amen. But if you are a child of God, you ought to be trying to see the best in me. Amen. Because all of us are flawed. If, if you are human, if you're a seed of Adam, you are flawed. And so we're dealing out today with love that intercedes, love that speaks on behalf of other people looking beyond their faults and seeing their needs. And I thank God that we have a Christ. Amen. We have a Savior who is an intercessor, intercessory Savior. He didn't come to find fault with us, for he came not into the world to condemn the world, though he could have, but he came that the world might be saved. And I don't know if you feel like shouting, but that makes me feel like shouting. I'm already short on time, so let me move in this lesson. I 
could just talk about Jesus all day long because I love him. And if you love him like I do, you should not get tired of hearing about him. Amen. People will love to get on the phone. They'll stay on, on there, the sun up to sundown, gossiping about other people. When you start talking about Jesus, you hear that click on that phone. God bless your heart. We're in the book of 1 Samuel, uh, chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. And again, those who do not know, uh, the, 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 these notes for this lesson are on my Facebook page and the New Salem Missionary Baptist Church Facebook page. I love the inner seeds. 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. And so as we come here, we need to understand this book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel is found in the Old Testament. It is in the section called History. Uh, there's a first Samuel and a second Samuel. They're named for uh, the judge Samuel. Amen. Uh, for, and, 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 and originally, first and second Samuel was one book. Uh, but for readability, uh, when they added verses to the Bible to, 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 to make it easier to read, uh, chapters and verses, uh, they broke first and second Samuel broken up from one book into two books. First Samuel covers about a hundred years. Second Samuel covers, I think about, about maybe 30 years. Uh, so in this book of first Samuel, uh, it spans 100 years dealing with the transition of Israel from godly judges, uh, to earthly Kings. Israel was set up as a nation. Israel was created as a nation by God. Amen. Not by human decree, but by God. And he wanted them to be special which meant that Israel God's was their God was their king which meant Israel was a theocracy amen they were governed by God but the world was governed by kings and Israel decided it didn't want to be special it wanted to be just like everybody else amen and so they wanted a king which is a monarchy like everyone else let me pause there when God does something in your life to make you unique and you throw that away to be like everybody else. Amen. Then that means you no longer want to be special in God's eyes. Let me just pause there for a minute. If God does something for you that makes you unique and you discard it to look like everybody else. Amen. That means you don't want to be special in God's eyes anymore. Amen. So when, so when, when, when we stop imitating Christ and start imitating those we see. We want to look and act like everybody else, be treated like everybody else. No, that says, God, don't treat me special anymore. Treat me like the world. Amen. And so Samuel, the first Samuel transit, watches Israel's, Israel's transition from a special nation, amen, to be like everybody else. They went from a theocracy, the only nation that was a theocracy, to, to a monarchy which was governed by earthly kings. Uh, the first part of this book, the first 12 chapters deal with the life of Samuel, the judge. Uh, the second portion of this book, chapters 31, 13 to 31, they deal with the life of King Saul, Israel's first king. Uh, and, and again, I remind you that first Samuel was originally, first Samuel was part of second Samuel as they were uh, originally one book. Now, this man, Samuel, this man, Samuel, <clears throat> prophet, priest, judge, uh, actually Samuel wore more than one hat. But notably, Samuel was the last judge of Israel. When Israel was in her sin cycle, uh, whenever she was in sin, God would raise up a judge, amen, to judge the situations that came, came about because of sin. And those judges were anointed by God to, to issue God's rule in the land. That was a theocracy. Uh, and again, there were corrupt people and corrupt judges. Remember, even Samuel, I'm sorry, uh, Samson, uh, actually was a judge. Uh, he was supposed to be the judge, but you know how Samuel, how Samson was? He got caught up in the world. But as Israel begins to petition God for a king as opposed to judge, uh, Samuel again uh, begins to feel rejected because Samuel assumes now that if, as he passes off the scene, that his sons, amen, would get to take over and become judges, but they are rejected. 
Uh, and God tells Samuel, he encourages Samuel, he says, Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're actually rejecting me. And so watch this, those who are listening, who may be God's representative to, to the world, amen, especially to, to the preachers. Remember that God sent us to people who don't want us. He sent us with a message that they don't want to hear. Amen. So don't be dismayed when people don't like you. Don't be dismayed when they're offended by your message. Amen. He said it's what they did to the green tree, they will do to the dry tree. And they, as they persecute the prophets, so they will persecute you. Amen. And so, but 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 we must remember this, that when we are rejected, it's not us, it's God. Because let, let, me, let me make this plain to you. If you go to a dope addict offering him some dope, he's not going to reject you. But if you go to him off in the word of God, he's going to he, he's going to reject you. So watch this. He's not rejecting you as a person. He's rejecting what you bring and what you stand for. Amen, somebody. And so whenever we reject the person, the person of God, uh, then we re we are rejecting God himself. And lay people, we need to remember that when God sends someone in your life to bring you a message, a word from him, don't reject them, embrace them, because we ought to be doing whatever we can to hear a word from God. There are many of us praying right now for a word from God. And and God has sent his word into the world through his messengers, and we won't get up and go here. Amen, somebody. You will never watch C Channel 3 News until you turn your TV on. Amen. So watch this. Sam becomes the last judge. Uh, God uses Samuel to actually anoint the first two kings of Israel. The first king, King Saul, he tells them to go out and choose them someone. And again, they chose the biggest, tallest, prettiest, most handsome man they could, King Saul. They looked at the outside of the package, but didn't see his heart. And, and Samuel was also the one who went to Jesse's house, amen, to anoint God's king after his own heart, the little ruddy shepherd boy by the name of David. Remember, Jesse brought all of his sons out, marched in front of Samuel in an old never ran. But he said, there must be someone else. They went out to the sheepfold to get David. And as soon as old David came in, amen, the oil began to run, run. And I hear David said, he anointed my head with oil. God bless you. Amen. And so Israel rejected Samuel. Amen. Um, they, and, and so they rejected God. In doing so in the transition, Samuel warned Israel of the cost of a king. He said, serving God is free, but a king is going to tax you. Why? Because everything that you have is going to belong to the king, even your sons and daughters. And so he's saying you're selling yourself away from God into slavery. Amen. Because the king will own you and own your life. Amen. And he, so it was Samuel uh, that after, uh, that after Saul, Saul started out, amen, um, uh, acting godly. But then Saul kind of got beside himself and started uh, fulfilling his desires to the desires of God. And he fell out of favor with God. And God rejected Saul. Amen. And he sent Samuel to find little King David. And so Samuel was the one who had to go and tell Saul that God had rejected him. Now, let me say this again. So watch this. The spokesperson of God in the earth is not the one that's designed to tell you what you want to hear. Did you get that? The preacher is not to tell you what you want to hear. He's to tell you what God said. Sometimes the news is good. Sometimes the news is bad. So Saul, uh, Samuel had to give Saul the bad news, just like Nathan had to give that King David bad news. Amen, somebody. So because the word of God is good for correction, sound doctrine, and reproof, it's not to scratch your ears and make you feel good all the time. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't, depending on your standing uh, with God at the time. And so this same Samuel who tells Saul of God's rejection of him, he's the one who goes to Jesse's house and anoint David. And we move in our context. Amen. We, we, we move further down the line uh, and you can find the background for this lesson in the immediate chapter in verse 18. David has slew Goliath. Amen. The giant Philistine. Amen. And remember, as, as they stood in the Valley of Elah, there was no one, not even a member of Saul's army, who would tackle this giant 
Goliath. Amen. And had that not been done, Philistine would have overthrown uh, Israel. But little bit of David, who was too small to hold Saul's armor and too small to hold Saul's spear. Amen. He took a little slingshot in a, in a smooth rock. Amen. And brought down the giant Goliath. And because he did that, Israel became victorious and Saul made David his armor bearer. Amen. David became a member of King Saul's royal household. Amen. And, and, and watch as he, as, as he went into Saul's household, uh, he became uh, covenant brothers, covenant friends with, with Saul's own son, Jonathan. And then he married Saul's daughter called Michael. That's M-I-C-H-A-L, not spelled with an E in it like we spell the, the, the male name. And so he's, he, 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 he's, he's a covenant brother of Saul's son, and he's the husband of Saul's daughter, amen, which actually makes him son, Saul's son-in-law. Now watch this. Uh, because of his military defeat of the lion, uh, he becomes a, a, a member of, of, of King Saul's army. And they've got to battle. And when they've got to battle, God was with them, not because of Saul. He was with them because of David. And whenever they would come back, uh, they would cheer them on because they had won another battle. And the people would sing this song, especially women, Saul killed a thousand. Now, that was a good verse. But the next verse would make him angry. They say Saul killed a thousand, but David killed ten thousand. Amen. And and it and, and it became such that the people began to esteem David more than they did King Saul. And Saul being the king. Uh, watched David, his own servant, and he became jealous of him. And, and it's sad that sometimes of, of who you see people jealous of. I know their father's jealous of their own sons and their mother's jealous of their own daughters. We have to watch it sometimes. That's coming up in the scripture. And so Saul tried to kill David twice. Amen. The first time they're in, in there and David's playing the harp and Saul picks up his javelin, and throws it at the wall, hoping to strike David. But David moves out of the way. God spares him. The next time Saul sets up a trap. Amen. He wants to offer his oldest daughter to David and say, you marry her, but I need you to go go and, and, and do something for me. Amen. He's sitting down in the Philistines and said, I, I need you to bring me some foreskins of the soldiers back. Amen. But but he was hoping David was killed, but God was with David. David, when he came back successful, but by that time, Saul had married off his older daughter and he David got the younger daughter, Michael. Amen. So two times because of his jealousy and because of his envy, God had tried to kill David with no success. And let me just help you, saints of God. Uh, when, 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 when you're faithful to God, God will elevate you in, before men. God will pick you up and turn you around. He'll place you on a high mountain that the world will know. Amen. That it must be the blessing of God in your life. But watch this. Everybody who, everybody who say they're for you, you're not going to be with you when God elevates you. Amen. You'll find jealousy. You'll find enemy. You'll find hatred. You'll find backbiting. Amen. From those those who claim to be godly and from those who claim to love even you, they'll begin to try to tear you down. But watch this. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied, for God will take care of you. Just like God stood by David, amen, against King Saul. God will stand by you above and in, in, in your enemies. That's why David said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear in times of trouble? He shall hide me and sit upon a rock. And now my head be lifted up above all my enemies which are round about me. Your enemies may still be there, but I promise you God will raise you up above them, and they'll look and say, how in the world did you make it over? I've been spending my all my time trying to tear you down, but look like every time I kick you down, God raise you out. I'm about to shout somebody, I need to slow down because my soul is about to happen. Amen. So, so, so let us be encouraged. Uh, as we as as we look at look at David's rise, Amen. Because there were many enemies, and every time God blesses you, somebody's not happy. Hmm. Let me say it again. Every time God blesses you, somebody's not happy. Did y'all get that? And 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 let me add this part for free. Some of those who won't be happy are those you went and told in your joy. You missed that. Some of those who will not be happy are those you went and told in your joy. And you told them because you thought they should be happy. Amen. So you got to be aware of who are in your circle. We are in 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. Uh, and, and so the stage has been set. Uh, Saul has tried to kill David twice. With no success, and here we go. But guess what? His anger, even though he understands that God is with David, 
Amen. His anger is not kindled. His, his anger has not been, been, been set aside. He's still angry. And so let me help you with this because it's an important point. Just because your enemy tried to destroy you, and there were folk who say you're not a child of God, that God has used you in a mighty way to, to demonstrate that he's your God and you're his child. Do not think that those folk are still going to be okay. Even when God has shown them your relationship, some of them are still going to backbite. Some of them are still going to hate you. And some of them are still going to be angry. Amen. And so even though when David went down and brought the foreskin of the Philistine soldiers back, the Bible says Saul knew God was with David. Amen. But that didn't make him any, like him any better. And even though there's some folk in your life, even in your church, that know God is with you, that means they still don't like you. That does not mean they like you because some folk in the church are not even with God. If there are people who don't love the Lord, how in the world do you expect them to love you? Oh my God, I'll leave that alone. Verse 1 says this, And Saul spake unto Jonathan, his son, and all his servants, that they should kill David. Now remember, Saul tried himself unsuccessfully, tried to set him up the Philistines unsuccessfully, so now Saul comes back to his own house. He came back to the people he controlled. His son, the heir to his throne, who ought to have complete allegiance to him because as Saul's life goes, so does his son. As Saul's future goes, so does his son. And then he had all those who were loyal to him, those he'd elevated, those he promoted, those in his employ. And he set this whole group. He charged them all. He said, I want you all to kill David. And it, and so what I'm doing is what Saul did. Saul stacked the deck. Amen. Because out of all these folk who claim to love me, out of all these folk who serve me, out of all these folk who are in my employ, surely, surely one of you all can get through to get David killed. I couldn't get it done. Philistine didn't, didn't get it done, but surely I got somebody here. It just looked like somebody ought to be able to get him killed. Amen, somebody. Verse 2 says this, the first portion. It says, but Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. Now watch this. Jonathan is Saul's son. He's the heir to Saul's throne because uh, technically the throne was passed from, from, from down to the family. And so Jonathan is the heir apparent. But, and he's been instructed by his father, amen, the one who sired him, the one who reared him, the one who feed him, the one who's protected him, that he needs to kill David. But David and Jonathan have made a covenant, amen. They're covenant brothers. And so now Jonathan has a choice to make. Where is his allegiance? And I'm taking my time on verse two because this is what we all face at some point in our Christian life. Jonathan says, I have a contemptuous father and I have a covenant friend. And my contemptuous father want me to kill my covenant friend. I got some scriptures coming. Just stay with me for a while. I'm headed somewhere. Because sometimes when you serve God, You've got to do something for, for folk who are not your blood that exalts them above those who are your blood. I got to, I got to go slow here. Our problem is we want to take daddy's blood in the church. But your father's blood, your family blood, is not what reigns in the church because there's no salvation in it. Only the blood of Jesus reigns in the church. And so Galatians goes like this. In as much as you have opportunity, do good unto all men, especially the household of faith. I believe that's Galatians 6 around 9 and 10, which means you do good unto all men, but you have a special debt to those who, who, who are of a household of faith. What are you saying? That means that God holds me to a level of accountability where I must treat my blood brother in Christ to a higher degree than my blood brother and my father. Hello, somebody. But how many churches get tore up because we elevate daddy's blood, the blood of Adam, a blood ahead of, above the blood of Jesus? And so Jonathan has, a, has, has to make a decision. Do I honor my covenant with my friend 
Or do I honor the contempt of my father? Look at portion B. Stay with me. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seek to kill thee. Oh, my goodness. So it appears in verse 2 that Jonathan made a decision. And he chose love over loyalty. Love over loyalty. He chose the love of his covenant friend above loyalty to his contemptuous father. Hmm. Now, some of you are saying, why did I say he loved his father? Because watch this. And please get this. Real love won't help do wrong. Ah. True love, God love won't help do wrong. So if you really love me according to God, you won't help me do wrong. If you help me in my mess, that's loyalty and not love. Somebody shout glory. If you help me in my mess, you're not loving me, you've been loyal to me. Because love won't help me get in trouble. Oh my God. And a lot of us are confused because even when we see family members in the wrong, we are holding them up in their mess. That is not loving them. That's being loyal. Goodness gracious. I'm, I hope I'm blessing somebody. Love won't help you do wrong. And so when it comes to, come to David, Jonathan chooses love. When it comes to his father, it would have been loyalty. Because if you love somebody, you're going to always tell them what's right. And so he chose love over loyalty. Yes, the record says, now I know you're wrestling with the scripture, because the Bible says that sons are ought to obey their father. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Watch this. You know what Exodus said. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be longer upon the earth. Land with the Lord thy God, give it thee. That's what God told Israel. In Proverbs 23, he says, hearken unto thy father that begot thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. So yes, the Bible says that. But watch this. Watch this. The Bible is not contradicting itself. It's not contradictory. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I told you he chose love over loyalty. And love is a preeminent Christian motive, which means love ought to always outrank. I'm teaching today. Love ought to always outrank loyalty. Love trumps loyalty. And so he said, when I look at Jonathan, when I look at David, I see love. When I look at my father, when what he wants, all I see is loyalty to do what he wants. Uh-huh. And so look at, look at what, what makes the decision. God has re already rejected my father, but the same God has anointed my friend. And so if I follow God, I must follow the anointed. Oh, I need some help here, you all. To follow God, I must follow the anointed. Not the one who currently is in the seat, but the one God has ordained for the seat. See, there's too many folk today in the seat, but hasn't been ordained for the seat. America's problem is Donald Trump is in the president's seat, but he was not ordained for that seat, which means he can't handle the seat. I need some help, y'all. And so, yes, yes, Jonathan can look back in Exodus. He looked, he can look back in Proverbs, but he says, I'm called to obey the higher law. And whenever the law of the land comes in conflict with God's higher law, we're called to obey the upper law. So the upper law said, I must follow love. Luke 14, 26 to 27. If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother, and his wife, and his children, and his brethren, and his sisters, yea, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come to me cannot be my disciple. Did you all get that? You all get that? He says, you got to love God so much 
that whatever you feel for those in your inner circle never even comes into play. And he said, it's going to look like sometimes you're hating your mother and father, so the brother, but you got to follow my word no matter what. And what's wrong with too many of us is we're afraid to go against family, even though family wrong. This happens even in the church. You see stuff over and over again, and you know what they're doing is wrong, but because they're family, I won't set up and tell them. But God said, you can't be my disciple doing that mess. You can't keep holding family up in mess. And look at the list he says. Father, mother, wife, children, brethren, sister, and even your own self. You got to learn how to stand against yourself when you when it comes to the word of God. Amen, somebody. Because it's not about you. It's about him, whether you want to be his disciple or not. Because God's word, God is his word. Are you all with me? And sometimes, Christians, you got to stand against your own family. I got some more scriptures coming. I got some more scriptures coming here because we need to we need to understand that. Watch this. He obeys a higher law. He obeys a higher law, even though the father who has raised him and protected him. The father who seeks to make a way for him to become king is seeking David's death. But Jonathan had to vote against his father because love does not help folk do wrong. That's only loyalty. And there are too many folk in this world who got loyalty confused with love. See, love is of God. So how can love help me do wrong if love is of God? If you say God is love, how can love help you sin? Somebody need to help. Somebody need to, need, need, somebody need, need to say something. Because we got too many folks sinning in the name of love. No, you're sinning in the name of loyalty. Come here, Matthew 10, 34 through 36. I'm, I'm going to try to get through on time. This is what Jesus says in Matthew. This is the Lord talking again. That was him and Luke I just read. He says, think not that I'm coming to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace. What it messed up in it, but a sword. For I am come to set a man in various against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be in his own household. See, because sometimes you got to, some folk to come to Christ in an unsaved household. See, I want to go to Tunica, but you want to pay tithes. We finna fight. When the husband want to go gambling, one woman want to pay a tithe. Mm -hmm. When I want to go to the shore, you want to go to Bible study, we get ready to fight. When I want to sing the blues, you want to sing the hymn, we finna fight. Are you, all, are, are you all with me? And so he says, because of Christ, the sword, a sword divides. That's why he said, I came to say the variance. We can't go to heaven by ourselves. It's individual decision, which means many times you got to stand against the folk in your own household. They're going to be the one to tell you to stop running up their church, giving them all your money, following that old preacher. You're not following that old preacher. You're following Christ because it's love, not loyalty. My, my, my. Ooh, let me dig myself out of that. And so now Jonathan says this. Now Jonathan is talking to David. Jonathan said, I pray thee. Now, therefore, I pray thee. So look at what Jonathan is doing. Jonathan is giving a request and a command at the same time. Jonathan has authority to command David. But he puts a command in form of request because he realized even though he has authority in the land, David has authority in God. David's elevation, uh, Jonathan's elevation comes through Saul, but David's elevation comes through God. So he recognized, he respects David being chosen by God. And we got to learn how to respect the people of God. Your pastor may be younger than you, but respect him. 
It's too many folk in the church trying to tell the preacher what to do because they think they know more. No, uh-uh, because God's going to tell the leader what he's not going to tell you. Somebody say, ouch. That's why he sent you a leader. Yeah, you can pray like you're on your own and you're supposed to, but God's still going to tell your pastor some things he ain't going to tell you. And there are too many folk in the church making errors because they never talk to their pastor. They talk to everybody but their own pastor. There are folk who will go seek another preacher than they actually pass them. Well, that's why you need to be if that's whose advice you're taking. We got too many folk make spiritual decisions and never consult their pastor. Oh, my goodness. Uh-huh. Because you know why? You know, your pastor's going to tell you what you don't want to hear, and you're looking for a co-signer. Most church members want a co-signer and not a pastor. Boy, I'm teaching this thing today. I know y'all hanging, y'all, 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 y'all can jump off Facebook because this don't sound, don't feel good. But I told you the Bible says the word of God is good for correction, reproof, and sound doctrine. It's not designed to make you feel good. And it's not one of them feel good days. Not one of them good, one of them feel good lessons. Are you still there? And so. He said, I pray thee, I'm going to respect your position. I'm not hung up on who I'm supposed to be, on who folk, on what folk call me. I'm hung up on what God calls you. Did you get that? Stop being hung up on, on human labels for folk and be get hung up on God's label for them. God said, David is a man of my own heart. So he says, thou, he said, take heed to thyself unto morning. Take heed thyself on the morning. He says, David, there's no time to waste. The danger is imminent and immediate. It's close at hand. Why? Because it's my own father. I need to take heed to thyself. Don't worry about it. I, I need, all this is designed to save, to secure you. He said in the next four, he says, and abide in a secret place and hide thyself. He says, hide and abide. Uh-huh. Now, watch this. We got too many young folk mixed, mixed up in the head. Because they say, you, David, going out like a buster. See, we believe in going, getting our get, getting our strap. And standing in the middle of the street, shooting up somebody's house. Or shooting somebody's car. Because you're a buster if you go hide in a bag. Uh-huh. God always gives us a way out. But we don't like that way and we won't take that way because it makes us look weak in the eyes of men. But the strongest man is the one who has the power to keep his mouth closed. The strongest man is the one who has the ability to take low because that's the man that knows who he is and whose he is despite what you think. See, all these folk out here shooting these, doing this stuff, they just puppets on a string trying to prove who they are to somebody else. That's why when they do their dirt, they hide. Listen, if I'm that bad, I'm going to stand in the street and shoot you and, 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 and tell the police, come on, get me. Why are you running to hide when the police get there if you so bad? So he said, hide and abide. And that's why the Lord said, be still. And I'll fight your battles. Are you all with me? Don't be so quick to bristle up. Don't be so quick to tell folk your mind. Don't be so quick to show your hand. He said, but be still and know that I'm God. I'll fight your battle if you be still. In Exodus 14, 14, the Lord told Israel, y'all don't have an army. He said, so the Lord should fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Sometimes the best thing you can do is get somewhere, sit down and keep your mouth shut. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. But sometimes we have to make some noise to show folk we are the empty wagon. Did you all get that? Sometimes we can't help but to make some noise to show folk we are the empty wagon. They didn't know you were the empty wagon until you start making the noise. I'm, I'm running out of time. Verse 3. Jonathan's still speaking. He said, and I will go and stand beside my father in the field where there are. Now watch this. He just told David to go to a secret place. 
He didn't say the secret place. He said our secret place. Which meant I'm not being specific. But Jonathan apparently knows what David's going to be. And he said, I will go and stand with my father in the field where thou art. Now I just said, go somewhere. In other words, what is Jonathan saying? He said, I know where you're going to be. That's what God tells him. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I always know where you are. Lord, with you always to the end of the world. He said, I won't be far from you. But guess what? Neither will the enemy. I'm going to be right there. And so will the one who's trying to kill you. But trust me. Are you all with me? Sometimes, even in the face of your enemies, you got to know that God is closer. He's always standing between you and your enemies. So you don't have to fear. Jonathan said, trust me. Because if I'm close standing by my father who wants to kill you, then my father is close. The Lord says in Psalm 110, 1, he says, sit on my right hand. And I will make your enemies your footstool. Watch this. Look at what that verse said. It's on my right hand. We mean I'm close to God. And if he make your enemy your footstool, your enemy got to be close too. Because your hand is not far from your foot. Hello, somebody. You didn't see that, did you? If God make your enemy your footstool, that means your enemy right at your feet. That's why he said in Psalm 27, my head lift up, lift up above all my enemies which are around about me. You ain't God. God don't have to move your enemies. Would you rather for God to move your enemies or to him to raise you up? See, when God raised you up high, it makes you closer to him. Hello, somebody. And so he said, I'm not going to be far. God is never far. God, no matter where you hide, God knows where you are. And so most time your enemies. But he said, trust me. He says, and I will commune with my father of thee. And I will see. And then I will tell thee. He says, I need you to trust me again. Trust me that when I come to you. I'm going to tell you everything you need to know, even about your enemy. See, God gives the saved people spirits of discernment. And he don't tell you who don't like you. See, folk think they throwing rocks hiding their hand, but you can't hide your hand from God. And don't get me wrong, God will tell it. Amen, somebody. He'll tell it. Paul said in Romans 11, he said, for brethren, I would not I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye be wise in your own conceits. The blindness in part happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. In other words, I'm going to tell you what you need to know. And my father going to be ignorant of it. He's telling the church, I'm going to enlighten you with the word of God. At the same time, hold in Israel blind. He says, you're going to be here. I know where you are, but my father not going to see you. And I'm going to come back and tell you what you need to know so you don't make the wrong decision. Wrong decision. You won't be wise in your own deceit. You're trying to figure it out. Now I'm starting to figure it out and ask God to show you. And so he said, I'm going to come back and tell you. So I need some double trust. Trust that when I'm with my dad, they're going to tell him where you are. And I'm going to come back and tell you what you need to know. Yes, that's my earthly father. But I'm following the will of my heavenly father. How many of those who are listening to me are willing to stand against your earthly father for the word of God? And I'm sad to say when it comes to church stuff, that ain't many. You won't find many. Most of us can't get away from that family junk. Hmm. Verse 4. Jonathan spake good of David unto Saul his father and said unto him, Let not the king sin against thy servant David. Oh, this is beautiful now. This is a joy. Just like Jesus, Jonathan goes to his father 
and intercedes on behalf of his friend. I'm about to shout now, you all. Just like Christ, Jonathan goes to his father and intercedes for his friend. Jesus is not the right hand of God interceding for us. Wow. You get that? Do you see the Christ in here? Jonathan becomes a Christ for David. He goes to his father and intercedes for his friend. And he says, let not the king, this was Jonathan. He didn't go and say, daddy, let not the king. In other words, Jonathan goes to his father, honoring his father's position. You see, sometimes it's not what you say but how you say it. Are you with me? It's not what you say, but how you say it. And so he says, I realize that being more than my father, you are the king, which means life, death in your hand, which means I'm coming to you out of respect for your role. Sometimes you can't respect the person, you gotta respect the position. In too many churches, folk disrespect the pastor. He put his pants on like I do. Yes, he does, but God put something in him he didn't put in you. Are you listening? See, God ain't did him with how he put his pants on. God did him with what he put in him. And the job he gave him. So you must respect the position. Well, if it if, if you can disrespect your pastor, why didn't you disrespect the judge when he told you to pay all that money? He put his pants on like you. Why you signed the ticket the police gave you? See, we only want to be big, bad, and grown in church. Yeah, well, we, we, we just a puppet. Which means we have less respect for God than we do anybody in this land. Oh, my goodness. Are you all with me? See, we talk about doing crazy stuff to Donald Trump. I do, too. But it's one thing we know. When you get Donald Trump, you can't lay a hand on him because of secret service. Just like you can't lay a hand on God because of all the legion of angels. Are you all here with me? And we all esteem God higher than men. But we do the exact opposite. So he respects his position and says king. And then he calls his attention to even a higher authority, God. He says, don't sin. I'm not coming to you out of loyalty. I'm coming back to you in love. You came to me in loyalty. Call on my loyalty. You wanted me to kill David. So I, I told you love does not require you to sin. So Saul came to Jonathan in loyalty. But Jonathan goes back to him in love. Are we learning something today? Even when your loved ones come to you out of loyalty, when they actually do wrong, there's loyalty, not love. Go back to them in love. Because love trumps loyalty. So he said, this is not about David. It's not about me. It's not about you. But it's about God. So he said, don't sin. I'm not asking you to don't not not to hurt David. I'm asking you don't hurt God. Because all sin, no matter who you mad at, all sin, no matter who did you wrong, all sin, no matter who you don't like, all sin is against God. See, you're not holy, which means I can't sin against you. The definition of sin is anything contrary to the will of God. Not contrary to you, not contrary to Smith, not contrary to your family, not contrary to America, not even contrary to your race. Sin is a contrary against the will of God. And so whenever we sin, amen, we're standing in opposition to God. And love won't let you do that because God is love. And so we're called to live by the standard of God, not by the standard of men. The Bible said that you ought to, to smite for smite. Jesus said, turn on the cheek. 
Bible says we, we, I mean, life says we, 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 we are eye for eye, two for two, but Jesus said forgive 70 times seven. That's God's standard. And if you're a child of God, you got to live by God's standard. My daddy told me as long as you're in my house, you got to live by my rule. And so as long as I'm in God's house, I got to live by his rule. And somebody tell me what is God's house? Come here, David. The same day, the earth is the Lord. The full is there of the world they did the world in. Which means I'm my father's child in my father's house as long as I'm on top of the ground. Which means his rules ought to go. And it does not matter what you think or how we feel about it. All sin puts in opposition of God. There is no right way to sin. There is no right reason to sin. I hope I'm helping somebody. James 4, 17, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is a, to him a sin. Whenever you know what to do and don't do it, you sin. Uh-huh. Psalm 51, 4. Dave, when he cried out in trouble, he said against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou might be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judges. Dave recognized that even though he thought he killed Uriah, he was sinning against God. Even though he violated Bathsheba, her marriage, he sinned against God. All sin is against God. You didn't cuss your past out, you cussed God out. You didn't cheat on your wife. You cheated on God. Somebody say, ouch. Did you get that? 4D says this. <clears throat> uh, where am I? 4B. 4B, I'm sorry. He's, Jonathan says this. <clears throat> he spoke well of him. He said, David is in no way harm, you saw. As a matter of fact, quite the opposite. David served you well as your military agent, as your armor bearer, and even as your musician. Everything David has done has been for you. So in verse 5, he says this, for he did put his, his life on the line and slew the Philistine, and the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. He says, when none of your soldiers, well, the ones you asked to kill David, would, would 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 do what you needed. Young David, who at that time was not even in your service, put his life on the line and killed Goliath. He did it in your name. And because of his sacrifice, God shed his amazing grace and blessing on Israel, the nation which you rule. David's popularity grew out of his service for you as a king. He was the captain of your army. He was your army bearer. That's how. So so why are you going to get mad at God for blessing David for doing good for you? Ain't it funny how you do good for folk and God bless you for doing good and the same folk you help get mad at you? Jonathan, this is Jonathan Point. He says David was not usurping you, but he was serving you. And in verse B, he says this. He says, thou saw it and did rejoice. So he said, when David was fighting for you, you were happy. You cheered him on. When David was playing the harm for you, you were happy. You were cheering him on. It's funny how folk in your life are happy when you're doing something for them. When you do something they don't like, they're ready to kill you. Oh, I'm going to leave that alone. So he said in verse C, he says, wherefore without sin against innocent blood to slay David without cause? He said, why in the world would you kill this man who was the only man who stood for you in battle? You, when you kill David, you kill the best you got. And do that, you're going to be guilty of innocent blood. God's going to hold you accountable. You're putting yourself in harm's way. You're trying to kill David. But you're killing yourself. And children of God, when folk are trying to kill you, don't have to worry. They're killing themselves. The old folks said if you dig one grave, you better dig two, dig one for me, another for you. Because the only person you can kill is yourself. 
That's why the songwriter said, Lord, deliver me because all I seem to do is hurt me. I'm trying to hurt you, but I hurt me. Look at look at last week's lesson. Last the last lessons. Joseph's brother didn't hurt Joseph. They elevated him. Every time they kicked down, God raised him up. They wind up hurting themselves. So he said, why would you hurt you? Why would you want to kill the only one you can depend on? And mad because God blessed them. There's some folk in your life who are mad because God blessed you. And God bless you because you helped them. You weren't helping yourself. He blessed you because you were helping them. <coughs> oh, my goodness. Let me hear him get out of here. Verse 6, and Saul hearkened to the voice of Jonathan. And swear as the Lord liveth that he shall not be slain. This is where Saul differs from us. Some of us are so caught up in our anger and our emotions that we won't change for nothing. It don't matter what nobody tell you, you ain't going to change because you got blood in your eyes. Saul heard. with his heart and he changed the reason we don't change because we never hear different between listening and hearing that's why he told the seven churches in asia minor in, in revelations uh he said he that hath ear let him hear what does say the spirit some of us just won't hear we hard-headed and hard-hearted and so we don't change we lead our own self into destruction you got folk in prison on death row because they wouldn't listen. You got folk who are crippled because they wouldn't listen. You got folk who took something and lost mind because they would not listen. You got folk grieving over stuff that changed their life because they would not listen. They wouldn't hear, is what I'm saying. Saul hears, <clears throat> and he makes a vow. <clears throat> now watch this. Saul vows that they would not be killed. I need you to catch this flip. In verse 6, and I get out of here. He did not vow that he would not kill David. He says they won't be killed. So I'm guarding, I'm going to guard against, I'm making a vow to guard David against me and everybody else. Did you all see that? I'm going to stand in the gap for David that he not be killed. He overrides his own personal history of rebellion against God. And he honors God this time by not sinning. Notice I didn't say he honored David. He honored God by not sinning. Because Saul's initial, uh, Jonathan's initial argument was that if to kill David, you're going to be sinning. And remember, sin is about God. Not about the person you're angry at. He makes a vow. And God demands vows be kept. And it makes God angry when you make a vow to honor it. He says it's better not to make a vow than to make one and break one. God said, I'd rather you just, just, just shut up. If you ain't going to do what you say, just shut up and don't do it. I can't hold you accountable for that. But when you make a vow and break it, it makes me angry. You got two scriptures that I'm not going to read them. Deuteronomy 23, 21, 20, 23. And then you've got the Ecclesiastes 5, 4 through 6. In verse 7, and Jonathan called David. <clears throat> And Jonathan showed him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul. And he was in his presence as time passed. Jonathan kept his word. Just like the Lord. Because the Lord always keeps his word. Jonathan called David like the Lord calls us. When David came, he took David to his father's house. Like Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, for in my father's house are many mansions. I go prepare a place for you. He called him back to his father's house, fully restored in the house. Just like Jesus seeks to have us fully restored in his father's house. Now, I ask you this. If Jesus, who committed no sin, can intercede for, an, for a sinful you on your behalf to a holy father to make him restored in his father's holy house, then who are you or who am I to be looking at folk faults? 
if he looked beyond my faults and saw my needs and I want to be like him, I ought to be looking beyond your faults to see your needs. But we have a tendency to make ourselves feel good by looking past the good and other folk to find fault with them. I got news for you. My fault don't make you look no better. My fault make you look no better. It don't matter how fat you say I got. If you fat, you still fat. It don't matter how great you say my hat and got. If you great, you still great. Your skin does not lose wrinkles. Talking about the wrinkles in my skin. Your mouth won't grow no new teeth. Talking about how many I'm missing. So my faults don't make you look no better. Because you know what? When I start telling folk how many teeth missing in your mouth laughing at you, all I'm doing is showing them my teeth. Hello, somebody. You didn't know I was snagging too. Till I opened my mouth to talk about yours. And when I started running my mouth laughing, you saw I was snagging too too. Do you realize that whatever you say negative about some other folk, the person you talk to looking at you first? If you stand with your friend and talk about somebody's shoes, watch your friend's eyes. They're going to look down at your shoes. Lord, deliver me because all I seem to do is hurt me. Jonathan kept his word in a seed for David and he was restored in his father's house. And you, Jesus' brother, says this. Now unto him. Now remember the same Jew denied Jesus before the resurrection. But the same Jew who denied Jesus before the resurrection thought he was my crazy brother. That crazy brother doing all the old crazy stuff. Drive my mom and daddy crazy. He says that now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence, see, I know you're sinful. I know you didn't lie, you didn't cheat, you didn't stole, you didn't rob, you thought everything. But he presents you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen. And again, this is Reverend J.W. Smith, Pastor New Salem Missionary Baptist Church. 2186 Hawkins Mill Road, thanking you for, for joining us for this Sunday school lesson. Uh, again, our doors will be open Sunday at 11 o'clock. Please, if you have a chance, come out and fellowship with us. If not, watch us on YouTube uh, or on Facebook, on my page or the New Salem Missionary Baptist Church Facebook page. Uh, again, we thank you. New Salem is a growing church for growing people, going all out for God. May the Lord bless you and keep you.